If you will allow me, unfortunately, I do not speak Spanish, so you will have to bear with me in English um, for this presentation that you will see is going to be a bit more technical, uh, maybe on an aspect that uh, is uh, even less known, and now we're very known for our statistics. And, uh, so this presentation is, is about the, the role of the OECD in standard setting. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to cover very quickly, give you an overview of, of what are the OECD legal instruments, how they are uh, developed within the OECD, the way in which our standards have been have become uh, international standards, I would say, beyond the OECD membership, because now for the OECD membership, I guess that you, you will have uh, already uh, uh, guessed that they, they are uh, important to our members, but how they've become even more global standards. And, and then I'll give you a very quick overview of, um, of the accession process uh, as it has unfolded up until now with the last few accession countries. So, um, what are the, the OECD uh, legal instruments? Uh, there's, um, first of all, there's over 250 of them. As Marcos was saying, now they cover vastly different areas um, now from nanotechnology to uh, molecular genetic testing, uh, there's some in the statistics area, there's some in the very social area, there's some in the education area, uh, in tax. Um, so it, many of the areas of governments will have uh, some legal instruments that have been developed within the OECD. Uh, there's four types uh, that uh, we know of. There's, I would say the, the bread and butter of the OECD are the recommendations. That's a vast number of, of our legal instruments fall into that category. The, the decisions on top. And then the, there's two other types that have also been, I would say, developed within the framework of the OECD. These are international agreements, freestanding uh, treaties, and uh, declarations. Um, what are um, decisions? Uh, decisions are legal instruments that are adopted by the Council of the OECD, so they're, they're collective acts. Uh, they're legally binding, they have more or less the same uh, statute as a, as a treaty. Uh, they very, very often um, include some implementation mechanisms that's built into the, the instrument itself. Um, there's about 30 of them uh, now in existence, and if I can give you one example, there's one very important one in the um, uh, area of mutual acceptance of data uh, in the assessments of chemicals. That has proved to be vastly important and has saved um, countries vast amounts of money. Um, then there are recommendations. They're also adopted by the Council, so they're also a, a collective act. They are not legally binding, but they are political commitments taken by members um, and by non-members that would adhere to them. Um, they are also very often implemented. There's a monitoring mechanism uh, of implementation. It's followed up, uh, and in fact, some of the very, very important um, instruments of the OECD are embodied in embodied in these recommendations. Again, now the, the, the fields covered are very, very varied. You'll find some in the consumer protection area, you'll find some in corporate governance, you'll find some in the statistics uh, uh, area. And there's about 180 uh, OECD recommendations. Declarations. Uh, there, in, in some way, they're very, very similar to, to recommendations, but they tend, they, they're presented slightly differently. Uh, they're, I would say, uh, an individual act of the countries that get together and, and have to together uh, make these uh, political statements. And there's about 30 of them. They tend to be adopted when there's ministerial meetings. Now, they, they tend to be the outcome of a ministerial meeting. And there's been one just last week uh, held in. Um, in Cancun on digital economy, 
that gave rise to one of these declarations, and, and in fact, Argentina is one of the countries that participated in this declaration on, on digital economy. There's about, again, 30 of them since uh, the first one developed was in 1974, so in, in a bit more, uh, uh, in 14 years or less, there's um, 30 of them. So they're not very, very uh, common. And then there's a few uh, international uh, in instruments, there are, there are treaties, they're legally binding as a treaty would be, uh, and they are negotiated in the framework of the OECD. Uh, and again, there's typically a, a follow-up, quite a serious follow-up setup that looks at the monitoring of the implementation. And you, you find that in our two uh, international agreements is one in the fight uh, against bribery in international business transaction, and another one is in uh, the mutual assistance uh, in tax matters. So, uh, let's turn now to how these legal instruments are developed within the OECD. And what I'll show you is, is typically the steps um, of development of, of, of the most common OECD um, legal instruments, which is uh, now recommendations and, and, um, and uh, decisions. So typically, it starts by data collection. So the OECD is, as Marcus was saying, has at heart of being evidence-based, so we collect all kinds of data uh, on an issue. It's analyzed, the policies are analyzed. There's a, a, a dialogue that takes place uh, on, on this analysis and the data that's been collected. And typically there we start to, to look at a common language and try to identify amongst the experience that we, we have collected, the data that we have available, uh, some best practices. Sometimes that's where it stops. There's a very interesting report that's written and everybody can read it and you know, there's a variety of, of, of possibilities. Sometimes we go a step further and there's enough common ground and enough needs for a, a policy guidance that the committee would say, okay, we can go a step further and develop a, a legal instrument. Now, typically, there will be uh, some, some negotiations going on on the elaboration of this legal uh, instrument. Um, so, the work starts, a, a committee works on an issue and concludes that we should have an OECD Act. Typically, uh, as, as you see, it's often very specialized. Um, they will entrust a working party, a smaller group of governmental expert assisted by the Secretariat to start working on a draft. And that's where I would say most of the work will happen. It's at the technical level with experts in the field uh, they will work on putting a draft together. When the draft is at the advanced stage, it will then go to the main committee that's responsible for, for um, this area, and then moves up the, the ladder to the executive committee, and then to the council where you will have the ambassador sitting, the official representative of government, and it's, I would say, a last check that this represents a whole of government view and that the country is prepared to make this political commitment in the case of, of recommendations. Legal instruments are adopted by consensus, um, which means that you know, to be adopted, there must not be an opposition of the member. A member. Um, if there's no opposition, the uh, legal instrument be, stands adopted. There's a possibility for a member to abstain, uh, which means that the instrument can go through as a, an OECD act, but it will not be applying to the abstaining member. Uh, the other members can also decide, that, oh, we have a key player here that's not prepared to play by this <laughs> discipline, should we have it in any case, but typically at that stage it will go through um, and, and there will be one abstention. In fact, they are extremely rare. There's very, very few abstentions on legal instruments. Most of them are adopted by full consensus with no, uh, no abstention 
There's te technically also a possibility of making a reservation on a legal instrument. It has happened, but again, it's extremely rare. Usually this process that I described does end up by all countries recommend, recognize that this is good practice and they're prepared to uh, go by it. So. Okay, let's turn now to uh, the OECD as, as an international standard setter, meaning also going beyond the OECD membership. Um, as um, as uh, Marcos was saying, our legal instruments are typically open by, to, to adherence by non-members. So that's, I would say, the, a very easy way of getting uh, our standards adopted beyond the OECD membership. Then, um, sometimes OECD standards are accepted as international standards. Two examples of these would be those in the areas of exchange of information in tax matters, um, where the standards developed in the OECD have been incorporated in all kinds of other instruments, now the UN, now the tax convention, uh, now the G20 has adopted uh, the OECD uh, standard as being the gold standard uh, internationally. You have the same kind of things for corporate governance principles where the OECD principles are typically recognized as, as the gold standard. Um, then you've had another way in which the OECD norms have found their way into other legal frameworks. Um, for example, in, the 19, in 1974, the, the, the principles of the polluter pace principle was developing as part of an OECD uh, recommendation. It, it came very, very early in, in the game. Uh, and over the years, it's found its way in now, EU legislation, it's found its way in, in the Rio Declaration that came about in 1992, I think. And then you have um, the use of the OECD as a forum for international uh, negotiation. That was the case of the anti barbary Convention. And I would say currently uh, there's a lot of work going on on uh, the project of the base erosions and profit, profit shifting, and there's some major negotiations going on. Um, maybe you'll skip. Yeah, quicker. Um, anti oof. Accession. Uh, quick, I know it's, it's a bit late and the day's probably been long for you, and so maybe I'll, I'll give you a, a quick overview of um, the accession process uh, in, in the OECD. Um, the accession process is, you know, to, to take the modern management uh, vocabulary, I would say 360 degree. Um, analysis of the public policies of a candidate country. And it serves to inform OECD members um, uh, before taking a decision to formally invite a country to, um, to uh, become a member. In some ways, some kind of general health check. Um, uh, so that's the, the use for the OECD. But it is also, and, and that has become clearer and clearer over uh, the last um, accession uh, processes, that it, it is also very important support to the candidate countries themselves in their own reform process. You know, it's a support to, it's a, a, a moment where a country can, in one go, prepare for a lot of, of reforms going on. And they'll have also the OECD um, Secretary support in doing so. So it's a, 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 a very, a very, very broad overview of the process itself. It starts by a council decision to open accession discussion. Um, that's what happened last year, for example, for Costa Rica and uh, Lithuania. Um, the next step is when when the council has decided that. There's a, a roadmap that is tailored to each accession country that is um, adopted also by the council. Typically, to give you an idea, um, there's about from 20 to 23 OECD committees uh, that will typically be asked to review the public policies 
uh, of a country, and it will change. Now, sometimes, for example, uh, in a country that is landlocked, we will not ask the fisheries committee to uh, to look at it in the country where it's very important. Uh, they, they they will. So it, it, there's some, I would say, some basic checklist that is common to all, but uh, there is a part of really tailor-made um, uh, review for each country. Um, the roadmap is implemented. It sets out the terms, the conditions, how the reviews are done, what are the core principles um, against which the, the country is going to be reviewed. And in the, in, in the most usual case, everything, everything goes uh, pretty well. And after about three years, as uh, Marcos was saying, uh, we um, were ready to invite the country to become a member. Um, the process ends uh, by a decision after all of these, um, all of these um, reviews have been done. Uh, country, the, the, member, the council would decide to invite the country to become an OEC, mem an OEC member. And together with this invitation, there will be the signature of an international agreement that embodies all the commitments that have been taken by the country during the accession process. So to expand a little bit on, on the benefits of, of accessions, what we've seen, uh, now obviously the, being an OCD member means that you, you, you do participate in, in uh, a lot of policy <coughs> discussion. The OCD has been known to be a, a pathfinder and looks for issues in, in novel areas that uh, later become mainstream. Um, Often it's a chance to participate in, in um, cutting edge issues, on discussion on those issues, and have a voice with other key members in developing common and innovative solutions uh, to, to, to the common challenges. Then, obviously, gives an access to OECD uh, expertise and, and peer review. Members have access to a vast reservoir of, of um, of data, of expertise, of research, of analysis uh, that is carried out on, on a wide range of, of economic and structural policy issues. They also benefit from this peer review, and this is part of uh, the culture of the OECD. It's, uh, it's, very, um, it's very important. It, it allows uh, countries to check on their own progress and areas where they, uh, they can um, uh, make improvement, they participate in standard setting that I just described, and obviously they also participate in, in all the, uh, the bodies of statistics that we maintain and allow a country to compare uh, against uh, one another. So um, I will stop here, and if you have any questions, most happy to take it.